Dr. Ober Papanek. Um, Ober received his PhD in computer science from uh, Tel Aviv University in Israel, and he got a Fulbright uh, postdoctoral fellowship award uh, to work with Dr. Martha Shenton and Dr. Carl Frederick Westheim at, at Westing at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And he recently received a MARSAT Young Investigator Award, and he's currently an instructor at um, in the Department of Psychiatry at Bergen and as well as Harvard School. His main research interest is to in, is in developing uh, new methods that could help understanding the relationship between neurodegeneration and neuroinflammation, especially education in neuropsychiatric disorder and neurodegenerative disorders. So I think today he's going to talk about some of the methods, like uh, free water method that he has been working on recently. So it's all yours. Thank you, Monica. Should I use the microphone? Yes. Yeah. I think the volume is yeah. Okay, so as uh, Monica described correctly, I'm from um, the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and I'm working in uh, the laboratory of uh, Dr. Martha Shenton, Psychiatry and Imaging Laboratory, and also in the laboratory of uh, Dr. C.F. Westin the laboratory of mathematics and imaging, and um, which means that we combine mathematical methods with clinical data. Uh, and I'll try to tell you a little bit about that today. <coughs> so the outline of my talk, uh, I'll be speaking mainly about uh, this method called free water imaging that I'll describe. But first, uh, just uh, to get everybody into context, I'll describe the diffusion imaging uh, in general and the diffusion tensor imaging model specifically which the free water imaging aims to enhance. And then I'll show uh, a few um, applications for the free water imaging, uh, starting with tractography, um, and then speaking a little bit about atrophy. And um, the, um, the thing that I'm mostly interested in is uh, neurodegeneration and inflammation, so I'll, I'll show a little, some examples on that, and, and I'll, I'll try to show examples from various clinical data, data sets that we have on different kinds of brain disorders. And I'll try to finish up with uh, a little bit of, uh, of um, methods, methodology, by explaining um, alternative ways to estimate the free water parameters that I'll define uh, in the next few slides. So um, just a quick introduction to diffusion imaging. Um, so I suppose many of you are already familiar with diffusion imaging, but the thing that I find most interesting is that it's covering so many scales. Um, we know that the, the voxel, voxel sizes in diffusion MRI are in the order of millimeters, uh, usually two millimeter cube, but maybe a little less, um, maybe a little more. But the thing that diffusion actually measures is, is in the micron level. We measure the, the motion of water molecules in the micron level, which is the same level as the sizes of tissue, the size of cells that we're looking at in the brain, which means that we are actually measuring things that happen in the cellular level. And uh, another scale that we have is in the centimeter scale, the entire brain scale, where we can actually combine information from different voxels and, and create connectivity maps or tractography that looks on, um, on things that happens in the, in the macroscopic brain level. Um, but for me, the microscopic level is of interest because it means that we, are, we should be able to, to, dif to, to find uh, interesting things that are happening in the, in the cellular level by using that diffusion method. And the main thing that people are looking at is whether things are anisotropic or isotropic, meaning if the water molecules are moving all in the same direction, in, in every direction the same, or if there is a pronounced direction, and that gives you, um, for example, a distinction between white matter and gray matter, but in diffusion imaging there is actually much more than that. So just starting from that simple model of diffusion tensor imaging, so uh, basically um, we have a tensor, which is a 3x3 three three metric, uh, matrix. Um, we can do a, a decomposition of this matrix into three scalars, uh, which tells you the uh, diffusion coefficient in, in, the, in three axes. So lambda 1 would be the principal axis. And we also have the direction of each of these axes, um, which is the information that we get from diffusion imaging, from DTI. 
And usually people uh, map them into scalars, such as fractional anisotropy, which gives you the variance, the normalized variance of those eigenvalues. And then you get those maps of FA, fractional anisotropy, that look that have high intensity in white matter, where things are elongated, and low intensity in gray matter and CSF, where things are where things are rounded. But there are also other ways of mapping these tensors into scalars, such as just looking on each individual uh, eigenvalue or on the mean of those eigen eigenvalue. And I'll be concentrating mainly on FA and mean diffusivity in in the talk. Although I also mentioned radial diffusivity which is the diffusion perpendicular to the main axis. So the most, um, probably, the, the application that brings the most pictures out of DTI is tractography. And this is simply following in all kinds of various uh, methods, following those directions of the tracks and creating streamlines or other representations that tells you which areas in the brains are connected to which other areas, or at least kind of estimate that. Um, but DDI also has limitations, and probably um, one of the most studied limitations of DTI is partial volume that is caused by fiber ambiguity, also known as crossing fibers. Um, so this happens when you have, within the same voxel, you have two um, fibers that um, pass, they could cross each other, they could branch, they could kiss or whatever, and in that crossing area, instead of having a pronounced direction of a fiber, if you just feed it into a tensor, you get uh, a spherical tensor, um, which looks like gray matter or CSF, and then if you look on those FA images, you see holes where we expect to see fibers, and this is just because those fibers are crossing. As a, as a result, if we use those methods, we see errors in fiber orientations, reduced FA values, and premature termination of fiber tracking, and there is um, probably a few hundreds of papers that, uh, by now that talk about how to deal with this problem and all kinds of fancy methods to deal with that. This is just one example. Another problem which is often uh, ignored is a similar partial volume problem but it is not caused by crossing fiber, it is caused by CSF contamination. Um, so CSF is pretty much water. It resides in the ventricles and around the brain parenchyma. And um, it, it has, it, water has much higher diffusivity than water within axons or within tissue because the water is free to diffuse. And when we have a fiber that, move, that goes next to the ventricles, that high diffusivity of the water would affect our estimation and bias it into a spherical shape again. And then basically we have exactly the same set of problems that we have with the crossing fibers, but this problem is less, um, is less addressed in the literature, uh, probably because it's not as fancy as the crossing fibers, but also because the amount of CSF contamination that we have is limited to fibers that actually go next to the ventricles which is uh, the corpus callosum, but the corpus callosum is big enough, so the partial volume is not very effective there, but also, but mainly fibers like the fornix that are small and pass next to the, pass next to the ventricles and then they, they disappear. Um, but what I'd like to show you in this talk is that CSF contamination or problems that are related to CSF contamination actually happen everywhere in the brain and they can actually give you interesting information about things that happen in the brain, about pathology that happens in the brain. So the problem uh, basically is the non-specificity of FA or any other um, DTI-derived measure. Um, so the main issue is that if you want to relate FA differences between groups or, or in subjects that have some clinical uh, disorder, and we want to say what was causing that disorder, even though we are measuring something that is in the microscopic scale, there are many microscopic um, uh, deficiencies that could cause that change in FA, usually the decrease in FA. It could be demyelination, it could be atrophy, um, uh, and all kinds of other, um, of other uh, pathologies, but also things that are not pathologies, such as crossing fibers, and also, also things that are just uh, related to the measurement itself, such as motion that could affect changes in FA or temperature, or even the scanning parameters, and many, many other things. So um, 
one of the aims of the work is to increase the specificity of those DTI measures. And just for an, 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 as an example, this is um, this is work by Ennis and Kindleman where they uh, defined a different uh, parameter out of DTI called the mode, which is actually showing the shape. And if you just look on FA, if we look on that line here, all of those shapes have the same FA value, but we can clearly see that this one is elongated, whereas this one is rounded, and um, and clearly they cannot be related to the same underlying um, underlying microscopy that describes whatever we're trying to measure. So we are trying to find alternative models that will increase the biological specificity of the diffusion MRI method. And the model that we propose is, is pretty much, is, is very simple, it's just a simple um, uh, alter alteration. It, it's a very uh, simple addition to the uh, diffusion tensor model. So basically, instead of one compartment, we're saying we have two compartments. And the one compartment that uh, you can see here basically is a DTI compartment, which means that any type of tensor, either spherical or elongated, could be fitted into that parameter here, the diffusion tensor of the tissue. And again, this is, this is um, a model that is aimed to deal with CSF contamination, I should. I should mention. So what we are adding is another compartment which has, instead of a diffusion tensor, it has a diffusion coefficient or an isotropic diffusion tensor that tries to, um, to model the CSF. And since we know that in the CSF we have basically water, we can fix that parameter into the diffusion coefficient of water in body temperature. So the model has two compartments, and this one is just the DTI model. And then we have a fractional volume that says how much of each compartment we have within the voxel. So in terms of parameters that has to be fitted into this model, we have the diffusion tensor, much like in DTI, and just one single additional parameter, this fractional volume. But even though it's just one single uh, additional parameter, a scalar parameter, and it has a very, um, you know, it has a very defined range between zero and one. The estimation of this model is completely ill-posed because for any um, tensor, I, excuse me, for any fractional volume I can define here, I can find a tensor that fits this uh, equation as as be, as good as other combination of tensor and fractional volumes. So uh, this model was initially proposed by uh, Carl Pierpaoli and Derek Jones in 2004, but in 2009 we took that further and, and proposed a mathematical framework to estimate this model from a single shell DTI, which means the regular DTI acquisition that you may, uh, you may do in your clinical studies. It requires uh, data which is as simple as six direction DTI. Obviously a more direction would give you more accuracy, but it could also work on the very simple uh, DTI acquisition. So we're basically applying mathematics in order to stabilize the fit. And this is probably the most mathematical uh, slide I have, so I'll just go over it very fast. And you know, you can just look on that message here. What we're trying to do using mathematics is to define uh, a continuity um, restriction which means we are trying to find what is the amount of free water, how much uh, vo free water volume we can have that once we remove it, we have the most biological um, fiber remaining. So uh, to define biological, we define it by piecewise continuous. And since fibers are defined as tensor, so this thing here defines a piecewise continuous uh, operator on the tensor field. Um, it's a very complicated mathematic idea, but uh, at the end, we're simplifying it a lot by saying that the, direction, that the distance between tensors is Euclidean. And uh, some of you who are familiar with all kinds of uh, distances between tensor may know that um, there was a recent trend that says that the distance between tensor is affine invariant or log Euclidean or what have not. And uh, it turns out that uh, Euclidean tensors are the most uh, appropriate way to 
Euclidean distances are the most appropriate way to describe um, the distances between tensors, which means that these um, monstrous ex expressions are simplified a lot. Um, so, making a long story shorter, the output of this method is basically um, those two parameters that we estimate, the fractional volume and the diffusion tensor. So the diffusion tensor is the diffusion tensor that is corrected for the free, for the free water. It's the diffusion tensor of the, of the tissue compartment, whereas the fractional volume, that F parameter, is the volume, or the 1 minus F, is the volume of how much free water we have. So it, if we map that free water into, uh, we have a scalar, we can, we, can, we can plot maps with it. So it has a range between 0 to 1. Uh, 1 is where we have only water, so it's in the CSF, it's around the brain parenchyma, and it's very close to 0 where we have tissue. So deep white matter, deep gray matter, and it has intermediate uh, values in the partial volume voxels, which are around the around the ventricles, and you know some of those voxels around the the brain parenchyma. But the interesting thing is that even though we're looking on deep white matter, we still see um, values of free water that are not zero. They're slightly higher than zero, uh, but they're not zero. Um, and the reason for it is that the free water compartment is basically uh, measuring diffusion that is very fast and it originates, it could only originate from molecules that, that, uh, that, can, that are free to, to diffuse within the extracellular space. Why extracellular? Because in the brain, the cellular space, um, is the, the size, the expected size of cells is too small to allow free diffusion. So whatever signal we get for that extra for the free water compartment has to come from the extracellular space, um, and the remaining um, compartment, the tissue compartment, it's signal that comes from the intracellular space, but also some signal that comes from the extracellular space as well. So it's whatever is left. Uh, why some signal comes from the extracellular space? Because you can you can imagine uh, a set of fibers that are densely packed. So even in the extracellular space, there are still densely packed. The, the diffusion is very much restricted. So this is not where we expect to see um, free water pockets. But we do have all kinds of pathologies. Or even in normal, we have all kinds of small pockets of uh, water, basically, if we just look on the histology. And this is probably what is picked up by the free water um, parameter. Sorry, can you just uh, elaborate your piecewise constancy constraint? What do you assume is piecewise constant? So, um, you ask, why do I assume piecewise constant? What? What? So I assume piecewise constant of tensors. So we have uh, two parameters. We have the fractional volume and we have the tissue tensor. And we assume that on the image that, um, that tensor is changing in a piecewise smooth fashion. Um, if, you, um, if you imagine a fiber, on a fiber, if you're looking just on the fiber, you would expect it to be smooth, smooth transition of tensors. Um, but if you're looking on would this... Would you expect that if you're moving perpendicular to the fiber? Excuse me? Would you expect that if you're moving perpendicular to the so fiber? So if, if we're moving perpendicular to the fiber, then we're, we're expecting piecewise smooth, which means within the fiber you have one type of diffusivity and outside the fiber you have another type of diffusivity. And um, one of the methods that I'll... Um, that I'll describe at the end um, actually tries and, and look only on along the fiber diffusivity. Um, that's the reason why it's piecewise smooth, because you expect it to be continuous, but not always continuous. So some results of what we can do with free water, and this is uh, two types of, of uh, subject. This is a normal control. This is a subject that had a tumor. And uh, in the normal control, we were just trying to uh, track the, um, the phonics. So we didn't use any sophisticated methods because uh, some of them would be able to track the phonics. But we just used the, the um, streamline propagation, the default um, um, uh, fiber tracking approach. 
and you know we, we use the region of interest to initialize the tracking here and it gets some of the foreign links but then it stops when it, go, when it comes very close to the ventricles. And if we do that CSF uh, contamination removal, we just look on the tensors that are corrected for free water, we see that there is a continuity. I mean, we see that we can uh, get the whole fiber, and this is using the same threshold of FA. Uh, I don't have this image here, but you know, one way to track this fiber is just to reduce the FA threshold to, let's say, very, very low number, but then you get lots of false positives. You get fibers that go all over the place because you just reduce their threshold. So this, this is kind of a, a sensitive way to, to do a specific change of, of threshold. But again, this is restricted mainly for the fornix. Um, so it's maybe not a very interesting problem in terms of tractography in, in normals, but in, um, but in case of, um, of tumors, for example, so here we see, uh, we don't see the tumor, but what we see here in yellow is actually the edema around the tumor. Um, no, I'm sorry, this is actually the tumor. It's a very big tumor. No, it's not like that. This is the edema, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so, so the thing is that if you just do tractography using, um, using DTI, DTI cannot pass through the edema because the edema is basically water and, um, and um, it just the same problem of CSO contamination, the FA becomes lower and we cannot track the corpus callosum, although we know it's there. And once we remove that, uh, remove that uh, CSF contamination, just using the corrected tensor, we are able to track through the entire fiber. Um, and these are some other examples um, that other people have done, tracking um, through the edema here is in blue, and we see all kinds of fiber that couldn't have been tracked otherwise, they would just stop when they hit that blue cloud, but with uh, removing that um, CSF contamination, we're able to see uh, connectivity. And obviously, this is very important for uh, preoperative planning because the, the reason why they use DTI in preoperative planning because they don't want to cut important um, fibers once they uh, remove the, the tumor. But if you cannot see those fibers, then you can accidentally think that they are not there, but they are, they are there. You just have to be careful in how you look at them. So this is one application for tractography, but this is, this is the one that I'm least interested on because I'm not sure what is, um, in general, what is the application of tractography. I'm more interested in things that happen in the mic microscopic scale. So, um, so this is a paper that came from uh, Claudia Metzler, and uh, this is the title of the paper, How and How Not to Correct for CSF Contamination in Diffusion MRI. Some of you may recognize that this is kind of the language that Derek Jones is using, and this is uh, a work that comes from his work from his lab. And here, what they are saying that controlling for partial volume is very non-trivial because the effect of partial volume on the diffusion measurements are extremely non-linear. Um, and this is coming uh, as uh, so. What they are saying is. You cannot just uh, estimate the volume of, of a fiber or the volume of, uh, or, of a region in the brain using, let's say, free surfer or something like that, and then use the volume measure as a control in a statistical, in a GLM approach, for instance. Use it as a, as a nuisance parameter. What they're saying that you have many nonlinearity here. One is caused by the fact that the grid of your voxels may not, may May not, I mean, it usually would not just sit on the grid of your, on the axis of your um, volume, which means that uh, depending on how exactly those are um, uh, aligned comparing with, with the object, it will introduce nonlinearity in how much um, partial volume you have. Here you don't have any partial volume, and here you have lots of partial volume. And even if you somehow are able to align, I don't know how, but if you were able to align it with your axis, there is still lots of nonlinearity just by the how the fractional volume is affecting the tensor. We can see this is how this is the tensor that you would have measured if you didn't do uh, a partial volume estimation, and it is affected by both the compartment in an exponential way, not in a linear way. And finally. All of that is also depending on the B value. 
which is introducing another complication into how to estimate or how to control for the partial volume. And lucky for me, they decided that the free water imaging is uh, between the how and how not to correct for CSF, it, it's the how. So, um, so what they're showing in their paper is that they're taking the fornix, which is, as I told you, that fiber that is the most susceptible for um, changes uh, to, to partial volume in CSF, and they're taking um, a group of subjects that vary with age between 50 and uh, 90. Sorry. And what they're showing in blue, this is what you get if you do DTI. If you get DTI, you see that as these are the, uh, f the trace, the f uh, these are the first, the third, and the mean eigenvalues. So if you, um, if you just uh, plot it over the age for DTI values, the average uh, diffusivity is over the fornix, you see that they are increasing steadily with age. Um, which means that FA is decreasing, and some people are saying that this might be related to the generation of the fornix. But what they showed is that once you control for CSF contamination, you actually don't see changes over over the span of of, of, of time of years, which means that the differences that we actually see in the fornix are related to the macro, to the macrostructure to the atrophy, whereas the fornix itself, the fiber itself still has uh, the same diffusivity uh, properties that it had earlier in, in the age. So this is one example of, of how to use it. And we are using it also in Alzheimer. This is with uh, Klaus Fritzsche, who came to our lab for a few months from Germany. And um, he had this uh, data set of Alzheimer patients. So on the top here, we are comparing Alzheimer um, subjects with controls, uh, age match controls, and what you see here is a TBSS analysis, which means that we only look on the skeleton of the white matter, and I'm going to return to TBSS along many of the results that I'll show, and um, you see here um, in blue, you see changes that DTI only found, and in red you see changes that only free water found, and in yellow you see changes that both methods found. So in the Alzheimer disease, compared to controls, uh, both methods are uh, equally sensitive and find widespread changes, as expected in Alzheimer. Uh, this is, I have to say, this is radial diffusivity. So this is uh, a measure that is related to axonal degeneration. Uh, but the more interesting question is what happens for MCI subjects, MCI, mild co cognitive impaired subjects. So these are subjects that have high tendency to become Alzheimer patients. And what they have here, they have collected an MCI data set, and then they waited a few years and they actually know which one have converted to Alzheimer and which one is stable. So we are able to compare between MCI converters, those that, those that convert to Alzheimer, with a stable MCI. And here what we see is again a widespread changes, but only in red, which means only the free water eliminated radial diffusivity can pick up those changes between MCI, between those that convert, okay, I should say, it, only free water um, corrected uh, radial diffusivity is able to kind of predict which of those subjects will convert to, um, to Alzheimer. And in yellow, we see that the corpus callosum is the only place where regular DTI would say that uh, that this subject actually, the converter subject actually had some kind of abnormality in excess to those that MCI subjects have. Um, so, continuing what we saw before, how uh, free water can correct for atrophy, here what we, is, what we think is that atrophy is actually inhomogeneous, heterogeneous uh, among those MCI subjects, but it's not specific to those that will convert and those that will not convert. And once we correct for the uh, atrophy effect, we are able to find those differences between the two groups. So this is another um, application for the for the free water, and which is the most in interesting for me um, because. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, when you're trying to estimate the free water, and as a function of p-value, you know, obviously it's going to be very dependent on p-value. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Any signal. Yes. Right. So, 
uh, why is it better to correct the free water using a lower value than just using a higher value and getting rid of free water entirely? So uh, I have uh, a method that describes how to use different B values uh, to estimate the free water, and it's a few slides uh, away, and once we get there, I'll be able to show it to you, basically. That's a good question. Um, the B value is very sensitive. is a very is a very important parameter in determining which um, in determining the, the sensitivity of, of, of the of the estimation of the free water. You're right. So I'll show it in a few slides. So here I'm I'm talking about another type of type of pathology that that is usually found in neurodegenerative disorders. Um, so there is there is a relationship a relationship. Uh, a complicated relationship between inflammation and axonal degeneration. So inflammation is the response of the, of the immune system once you have some kind of uh, pathogen or, or trauma or um, uh, and, and it, it's basically the microglia um, respond by swelling and by omitting, omitting cytokines that uh, what they do is they attack that um, that pathogen, but at the same time, they also induce excess um, water to come through the blood-brain barrier into the into the cellular space. So you basically have more water trying to clean out the pathogen and cytokines. So the cytokines, if you have a chronic uh, inflammation, they not only dissolve the pathogen, they also start to dissolve the tissue itself. So it's starting to create the generation by itself. On the other hand, the generation creates debris, let's say, and those debris have to be cleaned up by the inflammation. So inflammation causes the generation, the, gener the generation causes inflammation, and although those are two different uh, pathologies, they are very much connected to each other. And the thing is that DTI cannot distinguish between those two. If you have the generation, or let's say demyelination, you'll have a reduced FA, and if you have inflammation, which means more water basically within your specimen, you will also have reduced FA. So FA and also any other of the um, DTI measures cannot distinguish between those two pathologies. Um, but uh, with free water, inflammation would increase the free water volume, and the generation would change the FA of the um, of the tissue compartment without changing the free water volume. So using that logic, we are trying to distinguish between inflammation and the degeneration. And one example that we have, uh, that we did a long time ago, but we didn't pursue further just because we didn't have the, um, we didn't have the grant to do multiple sclerosis. That's actually the reason why we didn't do it. Uh, multiple sclerosis is the is probably the signature disorder that has this uh, inflammation and degeneration um, processes that that happen uh, within the tissue. And here we see a lesion. This is a free water map. It clearly shows that there is edema in the area of the lesion, which means more free water, more inflammation. But within that inflammation, we're able to see different types of degrees of uh, degeneration for the tissue itself. So the way I'm comparing it here is by comparing the corrected FA with the original FA, which means uh, this is the original FA, this is the corrected FA. So if, uh, if both of them are low, it probably means that this is gray matter or not white matter. Uh, if both of them are high, it probably means this is white matter that wasn't affected by the inflammation. And those intermediate values uh, mean either um, uh, white matter that was degenerated, this is the uh, cyan, and, um, and, not, and, and white matter that was not affected. So we can see that there is, we can see that there is um, certain, I mean, it, it fits the idea that in the center of the lesion there is the most damage, which is those cyan um, contours here. And as you go outside of the of the of the lesion, you see more um, fibers that may have a little bit of changes or not, not no changes at all. 
so we can kind of cluster what is happening underneath those um, those the edema that blocks it. But the more a more interesting so this is just a preliminary result, but the more interesting uh, results that we have is actually in schizophrenia. So schizophrenia is not your typical neurodegenerative disorder. Actually, most people would not argue that it's a neurodegenerative disorder, but um, but if you look carefully on what kind of pathology was found, so the, there, is, there is a lot of evidence for myelin alterations and a lot of evidence for neuroinflammation. And um, we hypothes hypothesize that it means that this is a neurodegenerative disorder. And if you look on what are, the, what are the clues that we have that says that we have myelin alterations, so first of all, Many DTI um, um, studies, I mean, it's, it's a very um, cross-study founding that there is a reduced effect in, in, in schizophrenia. The, the exact location varies, but uh, all over the board, people are finding reduced effect in schizophrenia. But again, we don't know what is causing that reduced effect, whether it's myelin or neuroinflammation. Um, but other that are not imaging re uh, related uh, clues are that you actually see in histology reduced oli oligodendrocytes and oligodendrocytes are those glia cells that create the myelin sheath and you also see decreased amount of macromolecules that you can measure in MTR or in other ways and in genetics you see abnormal expression of genes that are involved in the myelin production and the leading hypothesis regarding schizophrenia is that it's a connectivity syndrome, meaning something is happening to the, to the myelin, likely, um, likely a genetic um, uh, predisposition to have uh, myelin abnormalities that cause those connectivity issues. But then you also find clues for neuroinflammation. And interestingly, those are usually found at the onset of the, of the disease. And you see increased cytokines, you see reduced, this is interesting actually, you see reduced risk of psychosis following the treatment with uh, drugs that are uh, inflammation, um, uh, that reduce inflammation. And uh, PET shows inflammation, you know, uh, using the, the microglia ligand. So if we just run DTI on a group of first episodes of schizophrenia, First episodes of schizophrenia are uh, patients that were just admitted into, uh, the, they were just now uh, admitted uh, in their first psychotic um, episode, and we scanned them within their uh, first hospitalization. So the advantage is that their, uh, whatever pathology they have, it's, it's just starting now. They were almost normal just a few weeks ago, although I should say it almost because some of them do have all kinds of other problems. Um, and the other advantage is that they are, most of them are not yet on psychotic drugs or at least they are not getting those psychotic drugs for a considerable amount of time. So if you just do DTI, we find what other people find. We find that there is a widespread difference in FA and in mean diffusivity between um, the group of uh, first episodes of schizophrenia and controls. And um, it, it just covers the entire, almost the entire brain. And for me, it was very surprising because uh, what we know in chronics is that we do have changes in FA, but those changes are either spread around or localized uh, in specific areas such as the frontal lobe. Also, all of the myelin deficiencies that were found in histology were found in specific areas in the frontal lobe. So it kind of doesn't make sense to me how come, I mean, so people have, ch have said, okay, so you have a widespread myelin deficiency that affects all of the white matter. It must be genetic. It must be developmental. So what happens if we apply the free water correction? So the, the, the picture completely changes. Suddenly we see here in blue areas that have more free water and in red areas that have reduced FA, corrected FA. So obviously the corrected FA now does not cover the entire brain, but it is localized only in the frontal lobe. Whereas um, free water abnormalities, increased free water, is explaining those differences in FA that we saw before. 
So this gives us a new interpretation for what is the pathology that we see in first episode schizophrenia. We see localized FA changes and global free water changes. And if we take those areas where we see the FA changes and we plot them along the age, so we see here patient are those uh, triangles and controls are those squares, we see a very nice separation between them if you just take this one out. And this one I happen to know had uh, increased motion, so, but still, it is still over, you know, the age match. So we have one outlier here. So you have a very nice separation between uh, controls and patients in FA. And that corrected FA fits to uh, other um, histology and, and findings or uh, meta-analysis of DTI findings that says that the deficiency should be in the frontal lobe. And it also coincides, um, and it seems that it's specific to, to the tissue changes because we know that FAT is in the tissue, whereas FA measures everything. And it gives us just a very nice separation between the patient and controls. So the question is, what is that excessive free water that we see there? And our best guess is that this is actually neuroinflammation. Um, so uh, I won't go into detail why we think it's neuroinflammation, because we can rule out many other um, uh, reasons that could cause free water to increase. We see it both in gray matter and in white matter. This is the analysis in gray matter. And it just, we just see an increase all over the, the brain. So our conclusion here is uh, in the early stages of schizophrenia, we see global inflammation. We are assuming that this, we are proposing that this might be chronic inflammation because it's all over the brain and it might cause the degeneration that we actually see in the frontal lobe. And uh, this is a neurodegenerative pattern which suggests that schizophrenia may be actually a neurodegenerative disorder. And the important, thing, the important thing of it is that if you can detect it early enough and neuroinflammation is actually the main pathology, we could treat that neuroinflammation. And then we may prevent the symptoms that are accompanied in the later stages. So this is it for schizophrenia. Another uh, study that we have and I'll go briefly over is in, in TBI. And in TBI, the problem is a little different. In TBI, we know that there is brain trauma, but in mild TBI, we cannot see the trauma in CT or in anatomical MRI. Um, but those patients are symptomatic. They do have all kinds of um, functional abnormalities that are related directly to being hit on the head. But the problem is that where, where you've been hit on the head is probably going to affect the location of the abnormality. So... Uh, just using regular group analysis that is based on voxel-wise or on the skeleton or whatever, fiber-wise, is likely not to show uh, differences between the groups just because you have large heterogeneity. So what we need is an atlas-based tool. And our approach is to take um, a group of controls, as many as we can find, and to build an atlas out of it. By building an atlas, I mean creating the mean and standard deviation images of that, of that whole population. And then you can take a single subject and using a z-test or a z-score, you can compare each location in the brain with that, normal, um, with that normal atlas. So this is a, this is a method that uh, has been applied before. We didn't propose it. But what, what I was trying to do is to apply it on my TBI and to see what are the properties of those Z distributions. How sensitive and specific are those Z scores? Because what we find out very, very easily is that if you take a normal control, this is this guy here, and you compare it to, to, uh, to the atlas, you still see all kinds of abnormalities in, in extreme Z values. So obviously, just seeing uh, whether there are abnormalities is not enough in order to diagnose it as a TBR or not. So what we did here is that we created Z distributions. We look on the distribution of Z-score in the entire brain and we compare a group of normals with a group of mild TBI and we see that the distribution of Z-scores is different. And those green, uh, so, so the range is between minus and plus and zero means normal 
And green here says areas that are significantly different, ranges of these scores that are significantly different between the group of uh, TBI and the group of controls. And we can run tests um, and see how many subjects within each range are abnormal. And we see that it gives us a high value in red here for the TBI, low values, you know, zero, one, or two subjects at most for the controls in any parameters that we look on, free water, FA, or F corrected FA or FA. But the interesting thing is that if we just look on FA, we see that the, that the difference between those groups is in the negative area, which means area where FA in the controls are significantly lower than in the TBI, excuse me, FA in the TBI is significantly lower than controls. Uh, whereas if we, if we do the free water correction, we see that you can find significant and specific and sensitive changes both in the positive and negative domain of FA, which means that these are two different pathologies. And when we map it, we see this is the corrected FA. We see that in the mild TBI, these actually cluster into a structure. Here we can see that the corpus callosum in that specific subject is, um, is, is damaged or, or at least abnormal. So this is just, again, this is just preliminary results, but this is the direction that we think we should go, that by combining those Z distributions with, um, with clusters or with shapes that those um, abnormality create, we may be able to define what are uh, false positives uh, versus um, real positives. So uh, this is it for, for the... Um, for the clinical applications that we have, and you know, just uh, to give a little more detail on, on the how this is being estimated and to answer both your questions. So the free water um, estimation is not perfect by any way. Uh, we are starting with, with a very ill pose problem, and uh, which means that our solution heavily depends on the regularization. And if the assumption of the regular, regularization, such as whether it is piecewise smooth, as you mentioned, is not correct, then our estimation is not correct. And, um, and the value itself that we get for the free water, those numbers are, I wouldn't argue that they are physical numbers. When, when we have 0 0.2, I wouldn't say that we have 20% of free water because those values are biased by various uh, by various um, um, uh, physical or not physical reasons, but at least I can, I think that they are biased equally across groups and equally across the image. So one bias is that they are actually weighted by the T1 and T2 of the tissue, of the compartment. So if you have a change in T1 and T2 in a compartment, that would change also the fractional volume of the compartment. So uh, we may be actually looking on changes in T1 and T2. Um, a solution for that would be to acquire multi-echo T1, T2, uh, multi-echo T2. T1 is probably not affecting, but multi-echo T2 and uh, in conjunction with, with the free water and just to see what's happening there. But we don't have this data yet. Um, another bias could be a shift by a constant um, so it could be, since we are just doing regularization, it's an ill post problem, it could be that our entire image is shifted by a constant, is either higher or, or lower. Uh, but since it's constant, then it shouldn't matter when you do group comparison. You can, uh, that constant should not be different in, in those groups as long as you use the same method. Finally, it could be, cro it could be biased by crossing fibers. So the method still assumes a single tensor, what happens in crossing fibers. And it also does not account for exchange. If you have exchange, especially in gray matter, then more water molecules seem as if they are free, and that could bias the estimation as well. So one solution that we have for the crossing fibers and for the application of uh, maybe not the right um, um, assumption to our regularization uh, filter is um, tr is doing the estimation while tracking. So obviously the limitation of that that it is 
it can only show you uh, values on the white matter, not on the gray matter, because fiber cracks does not go to the gray matter. Uh, and the method we use is called unscented common filters, which basically do iterative estimation and tracking. Um, and the model that you can use there is any model that, you, you, that you'd like. It could be a one tensor, one tensor plus free water, which is the model that I showed you before. It could be two tensor, two tensor plus free water, or also spherical harmonics, all kinds of uh, different types of spherical harmonics. And uh, this is another uh, student that we had in our lab that uh, ran those experiments. And um, he actually found out that you see the most, um, uh, he had a way of how to define fibers that are expected versus those that are not expected. And he found that the two tensor plus the free order shows the most specific or expected types of fibers that you want to see comparing to uh, other, you know, more sophisticated spherical harmonics methods. Um, but the thing is also that the free water map that we get, which is only in white matter, has comparable, comparable values to the free water map that we get uh, by the other method. Uh, another method that we have is multi-shell, and here is uh, your question about how sensitive is it to B-value. So yes, it is very sensitive to B-value, and um, there are ranges of B-values where we would see better definition of better separation of free water than other ranges of B-values. And those ranges are actually uh, the lower ranges. We don't have to go to extreme high B-values because you don't have any signal in extreme high B-value from free water. Um, so as we saw before, the diffusion coefficient that we measure is is dependent on the B value. And the multi-shell approach basically says instead of acquiring diffusion measures in one B value, let's have many B values. And in each B value, we measure in many directions. So each B value is a shell, and we have multi-shell acquisition. So uh, this is work that we presented in MIKAI this year. We can actually take advantage of the fact that free water disappears in the higher B value shells. And if we construct those shells uh, right, which means we need to have at least two shells that have, that are, that have high B value, and by high I mean DTI order B value, around 2,000, uh, excuse me, around 1,000. So this is 900 and 1,400 in this case. These are areas where if you look on the ventricles, it's completely black. There isn't any signal left from, um, from free water. So if we take those two and call them high shell, we can estimate tensor just by using those two without using the B0. This is what we see here. We estimate both the B0 and the diffusion tensor of the high shell. And this gives us automatically diffusion tensors that have no effect of free water. Free water correct the diffusion tensors. And then we can plug that diffusion tensor into the equation of the, of the model and extract the free water element by just looking on the lower B values where we actually have signal from the free water. So uh, by using this approach, we can decrease the dependency on, on the regularization. We can estimate now free water just from the data. But uh, we are still using the regularization because um, most, of the, most of the acquisition of the multi-shell acquisition that we have are not optimized for, um, for, you know, for having exactly those shells where you, you don't have any signal and shells where you have a lot of signal. Sometimes you have intermediate shells. And then those measures could be a little bit biased, so we use them as initialization for the regularization um, method. And, um, and the thing is that we, even using that more sophisticated multi-shell approach, the maps that we acquire are pretty much similar between the single shell and the multi-shell, which is reassuring that it means that the regularization that we apply for the single shell works. But you do see that the single shell, I mean, I don't know if it shows on that screen, but the single shell is much smoother than the multi-shell because the regularization takes more effect in the single shell case than in the multi-shell case. But also if we, are, if we have an optimized multi-shell approach, then just using the initialization, just using the data and estimating those parameters is very, very close to the uh, converged uh, point. 
So the regularization does not have a lot of effect. It is a little bit smoother, but doesn't have a lot of effect. So it, re it is reassuring that multi-shell, that single shell is still usable, but it also says that if you are interested really in this very, very small details, then you should probably run the multi-shell. So to summarize, um, I hope that I showed you that uh, that free water is, is a nice uh, addition to the DTI family. Uh, it provides lots of things that DTI also provides, but also things that DTI cannot provide, such as tracking through edema or uh, quantifying atrophy, controlling for atrophy, and distinguishing neural inflammation from neural degeneration. And since it is applicable to DTI data, any DTI data, then we argue that or at least recommend that people uh, use it instead of the DTI model. And people are starting to use it instead of the DTI model. And we still have many challenges to go in order to make it, um, in order to prove everything. So um, first thing, how to evaluate those things. So if you notice, I haven't showed you any phantom or synthetic data because it's very complicated to, um, to evaluate things with the regularization because the regularization enforces things that can only happen in, in, in I mean we need a very very realistic phantom in order to, to find out whether it works on a phantom or not so we're, we, the phantoms that we have are very simple so we're not there yet um, we still have to do uh, an extens extensive comparison between those three methods to um, estimate the free order that I showed you and there are other models for free water. For example, um, one of the models that come from uh, UCL called Nodi, uh, and uh, we have an isomeric abstract where, where uh, we compare Nodi and, and free water, and we found uh, lots of similarities. And um, there should be other any any diffusion model could include a free water or an isotropic compartment in it. And then again, we have to do validation, which is the problem that also DTI has. Uh, and we're working on, on, on a few animal models now, rats and monkeys. This is in collaboration with uh, Nikos Smakris from here. Um, we are trying to, we are starting right now a PET MRI study, not using a PET MRI machine, but um, a PET and MRI where we are trying to show that uh, differences in free water actually correlate with differences in that uh, neuroinflammation ligand. And uh, finally, histology would be very useful to, s to look at to see whether we are actually uh, sensitive to, to, to inflammation. But the problem is that it's hard to see inflammation in histology, or at least it's hard to see the water in histology because it's not there anymore. Um, so we're still trying to find out how to do that, and we're working there with uh, people in BU to use all kind of tracer for uh, neuroinflammation, for glia activation or what have you in, uh, in, in histology tissue. So that's it, and um, I'd like to thank uh, the people I work with in BWH, specifically Martha Shenton and CF Weston, who are the heads of the, of the two labs that I work in. And lots of the work that I showed you comes from collaboration with Sylvan Buix. And those two students that we had, Klaus Fritsch, uh, who is no longer a student, he has his own group now in, in Germany, and Christian Baumgartner, who is in UCL, and other collaborators that we have, uh, Derek Jones's group, and the TBI data that I showed you that comes from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Thank you.